So I think we'll get started. Thank you for uh, joining. This is not the uh, programmatic, pragmatic, you know, how you do X, Y, Z with, with OpenStack. But I think what's really interesting about um, this talk and as applicable today is, is how do you actually take an investment like OpenStack and actually move it into a hybrid cloud and then move it beyond that into what we call borderless computing. And so remember when you were young, you know, and we started out in terms of finger painting, you can do pretty much whatever you wanted to, right? You could take anything you wanted, any colors, and put them anywhere you wanted to on a piece of paper. And being a child and doing that was actually kind of fun. But then, you know, you kind of got into kindergarten, and everyone started saying, well, hey, you know, make sure you start drawing in the lines, all right? Don't draw outside the lines. You actually get, you know, a frowny face versus a, a smiley sticker for, for doing that. As we got older, right, I actually started traveling. I grew up in Maryland on the East Coast, been on the West Coast for 21 years or so. Um, actually, no longer, not 25 years. Um, and we had this notion of going from state to state. Maryland's a very small state, so you kind of move in between things very easily. And you had this big sign, and I remember kind of saying to my dad, what the heck's that mean? He goes, oh, well, we're entering into a new state. But the roads were the same, but they were a little bit crappier. Maryland had better roads at the time. Um, but everything kind of felt the same, but it was kind of like, oh, okay, there's this change, right? Something is actually different. Cars are the same, roads are the same, but things are starting to change. And then we actually start to get on airplanes and travel outside of the United States and go somewhere else. Then all of a sudden it becomes very real, that you're actually in a very, very different environment. You have to prove your identity. You have to, you know, today, you know, answer questions like, well, what are you doing here? How long are you going to stay? What hotel are you in, right? really trying to figure out what's going on. And the rules about what you can, can't do are changing. And so why do borders matter and why is this applicable to anyone at you know, OpenStack uh, Vancouver? Hopefully you understand that the exact same metaphor around you know, finger painting and traveling you know, applies to how do we actually use, consume, um, and take advantage of computing resources? Whether you still think of them as raw compute network and storage, or you think of them higher level services, there's borders, right? And they're technology borders. For the most part, computers are the same, the chips are the same, the disks, SSDs kind of are all the same. Yet, when we talk about hybrid, or we talk about borderless computing, the notion of being able to seamlessly use all of these things together, kind of like finger painting in, in uh, pre-kindergarten, really feels like it's something that can't be achieved today, that it's further out than most people think. And so, for me at least, it's kind of interesting you know, to realize you know, where we've been. Um, the notion that we've kind of only been in this about 50 years, um, I think is a lot lost on the community at, at large of how far we've actually come. I mean, in the 1970s, we had mainframes. You had to go into a special building that you had access to. Everything was kind of there. We all know these stories, but the time frame of which we've actually looked in terms of on here, 40 plus years, um, is very, very short. Right? We went into client server. You know, I'm, I'm older, so I remember all of these trends because I was uh, living them. And we moved then from the desktop to what I consider some of the big mega trends that hit, all right? Internet and cloud, and then mobile. Um, what's interesting is, is that we have 10 times the number of users every cycle, and I actually think that's going to keep going up. Even more importantly, we have 100 times of the data being generated, and I'll explain why I think that's really, really important. This quote by my uh, former boss, um, Eric Schmidt at Google, every two days we create as much information as we did in totality up to 2003. I think this quote's like three years old, too. So the amount of data that we're actually generating and the amount of data that we need to have access to and the way we process it and the way we make services out of it is going to be a key into kind of why this notion of hybrid and borderless computing, at least in my opinion, is important. We all have some sort of, of touch base with information technology, right, IT. But the IT that I grew up with, you know, going to school a um, long time ago, um, is very, very different, I think, than what the world of modern IT is today, where it's rooted around where's the data being generated? What APIs can we put on that data, not only to access it, 
but to generate services that then present their own API. Right? So this data API and services, and data as we know is always growing. I think the numbers are, you know, any number you say is probably gonna be wrong. Um, we were speaking with a Gartner analyst the other day and I made a comment that kind of made her laugh. We're, we're dealing with 50,000 year old hardware in our brains. It's very hard for us to actually think exponentially. We think linearly, one foot in front of the other. That's just the way we're, we're built. Um, so any type of estimates on data, I believe, are actually going to be inaccurate, even though they feel like they're, you know, just crazy uh, in terms of how big they're going. But what people, I think, also are starting to understand is that data by itself doesn't really do a lot. And so you probably heard of terms like the API economy, where things are, are being massively exploded around how you actually access the data. Um, and then services, right? Everything is adding new capabilities, new ways to process the data into information which then is useful and then we can actually use that to do important things. Um, I currently reside in San Francisco and we have this notion of personalized everything, right? Uber and TaskRabbit and Caviar and all these kind of things. IT is around personalized data for everybody in every organization in, in an IT organization in my opinion. Cloud computing has kind of actually liberated the fact that all of this data can actually be used. Now, I believe, and I don't know if this number is right, I believe the majority of data still goes useless, meaning we do, don't do anything with it. But we're kind of starting to try to catch up, and cloud computing was a big deal. Again, for me, I remember when it might take three months just to get a computer. You know, we had to do a CapEx budget and a justification and send the order in, and they always screwed it up, so then we had to send it back, and then it would come and somebody would burn it in, and, and they put the operating system on it, and then you know, three, four, six months later, they'd hand it to you and say, here you go, and it's like, well, great, I need five more, what do I do now? And then you get back in line for a six-month cycle. The dawn of virtualization and what kind of VMware did in terms of extracting what actually existed on mainframes a long, long time ago, but kind of popularizing it. Um, I actually used it when it first came out, but I used it for QA to actually do Windows installers so that I didn't have to keep re-imaging re Windows machines. When they actually moved into the data center, right, with a deal with, with IBM, it became this notion of dawn of virtualization, and you came down to the number of days that it would take to actually get things spun up, which was a huge deal compared to three, six months. Nowadays, most cloud providers, it's less than two minutes, and with the new dawn of containers, right, which are very, very fast, sometimes sub one second, right, 500 millisecond on for example, the platform that the company that I work for actually provides. And so what's interesting here is, is that trends go in two phases in my opinion. One is keep doing the things that you're doing, just do them faster. Then eventually you get to a point where you can't do it any faster and then you actually start thinking about how to do things differently. We're getting to the point where we're gonna start thinking about things differently. At least for me and, and a lot of the people uh, at Epsera and throughout the industry of have heard me speak or, or know of me say, the world does not need faster VMs or faster containers. They're fast enough. Now how are we actually gonna do things slightly differently with the technology that we have? But this cycle um, is pretty amazing. And if you look at the 45 year cycle I put up on the previous slide, this one is actually about 11 years or so, right? So in 11 years we've gone from Three months is gracious, it's probably like six to nine months if I remember correctly, down to you know, less than a second you can actually get a computing resource that you can log into and start doing things with. So there's clear benefits, right? The economies of scale, um, reduce overall spending, capital costs shift from CapEx to OpEx. Now sometimes that can be more expensive, less expensive. The interesting part here is, is that it's choice. And for me, the only thing that keeps getting more expensive in technology is the people that are sitting in this room. Everything else is getting cheaper. So anything you do that involves more people, probably don't do that. Look at the other way. And cloud computing is a way to say, don't worry about people to maintain the buildings, figure out energy, powering, cooling, billing, keeping computers running, fixing them, all that other stuff. And so even though an Amazon bill can be extremely expensive sometimes, right, you have to actually look at the headcount that you're saving a lot of times. And you get a lot of business and technology agility. Um, we had a, uh, a little gathering last night and someone who kind of ran a lot of the um, technology at Zynga was there and you know, he was talking about the move from Amazon back into Zynga 
with I think it was called Z Cloud, and now they're moving back into Amazon, right? And you know, he was kind of scratching his head at why they were doing it, but the agility that cloud you know, computing provides is pretty obvious. Yet, these borders keep popping up, right? Zynga did a lot of tremendous uh, innovation, in my opinion, on figuring out how to move from Amazon to Z Cloud, Z Cloud back and forth. Um, but it's not easy, and for the most part, at least from what I've seen, is, is that people who want to actually move to the cloud, they pick one provider. And I think Gartner just came out with a big magic quadrant that shows Amazon's way up and to the right, you know, ahead of everyone else, two levels that people didn't actually expect at all. So most people are going to go, well, if we're going to go there, let's go with Amazon. So some of the benefits, private, right? Security, reliability, high performance. Uh, public cloud benefit, more cost effective, agile, flexible, easier to deploy. Um, anything you put in either one of those columns, I can promise you is probably going to be a wrong depending on who you're talking to. But there's differences, right? There's reasons for certain companies. Um, last night again, someone said, hey, do you believe we're all going to public cloud? And I said, absolutely not. Um, I do believe hybrid is, is kind of where everything's going, and that's why we have such a huge focus at Epsara on hybrid. But even when I was at Google doing Gmail, I realized that I would trust Gmail over anything that any IT organization could set up in terms of a, of a mail system, knowing kind of what was going on underneath the covers, right? Mm -hmm. Data at rest, data in motion, aux, you know, access, audit trails, all this other stuff. And the ability that, at least for me, when I get into a hotel room, if I want to make sure my Wi-Fi connection is working, I just type in google.com and hit enter. I assume Google's always on. It's always there, right? And yet, when I started there, they were built on computers that were put together with Velcro. They were, they were literally open trays, and they were Velcro, all the pieces were Velcroed in. Hardware never talked to software. Software never talked to machines, which was kind of a, a light bulb moment for me. These all have borders in terms of public and private. For the most part, anyone, at least from my perspective, who says they have a hybrid cloud strategy is saying these apps will run on-premise and totally new greenfield apps will run in the cloud and never the two shall meet. And we know that there's just limited viability to that type of approach. And so there's lots of challenges around this. For example, you know, private cloud is expensive to build out in terms of capex, time, people. Um, it's not only you know, it's not always as reliable as people think. Um, public cloud is perceived to be less secure, and some of that's been kind of proven out, although, I, again, I would probably trust public cloud more, uh, to be honest with you. Um, the biggest one for us is public cloud has inconsistent across multiple vendors and your private cloud stuff, the ability to secure, regulate policy, regulate service access, regulate network connectivity between these things. And so for us, you know, and I believe once technology actually gets to a maturity level that everyone can trust it, hybrid cloud is the real answer, right, to have that choice. Um, it is a lower total cost of ownership. I think the availability and the agility, kind of like what the Zynga model was, going back and forth and being able to pick and choose depending on what they were trying to do. One of the other big things here is, is that compute network and storage and doing that faster, as I said, is interesting, but we're going to change. And where we're changing now is, is what I call the services ecosystem. And so if you look at Amazon, right, Amazon has, of course, lots of computers, have them in lots of geographies. But the stickiness that they're really, really driving is around services, right? If you want to build your software faster, which, by the way, software systems will never get any simpler than they are today. Tomorrow they're going to be more complex. You want to build less and assemble more. And what Amazon's doing is, is they're giving you all the common off-the-shelf services to assemble a system and just build what makes you different. But what's interesting is, again, going back to my comment, most organizations that we've talked to will pick one cloud. But what happens if another cloud comes up and they really do have a service that you absolutely want for one application? Most people won't do that. They'll say, don't worry about it. At least to my knowledge, the only customer that Amazon has lost um, was to IBM, and it had nothing to do with their computers or their network or storage. It had to do with a Watson service. 
and this company had an application that they really wanted to meet, you know, use um, state-of-the-art machine learning represented by the Watson service to do that. And so hopefully this isn't news to anyone. It's a, it's a massively growing market. It's projected to get to about $90 billion in less than five years. That's pretty big, um, even in terms of um, all of the numbers that you see flying around. Um, and hybrid is obviously something that everyone has been talking about. But it means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. But I think the point that we can all agree on is it is going to be a massive opportunity. So for us and, and my perspective, you know, it's not perfect, and I think we all know that it's not perfect. Again, if any of you saw the keynote the other morning where you know, Google and Rackspace were trying to actually demonstrate some of the hybrid cloud stuff, you know, it almost worked. Um, well, almost isn't good enough, right? It has to be seamless and trusted, and it has to be able to, in my opinion, deliver trust across any type of, of computing resources that you use. And that's hard. And it's hard, and for the most part, people think it's boring, and it's not very sexy, and nobody really cares about this stuff. But it's one of the biggest impediments to why hybrid cloud, at least in terms of actually using these resources totally fungibly and, and inter, you know, interchangeably, hasn't really occurred yet. Now, what's interesting about the borders, in my opinion, is, um, and I had a reporter ask me the other day, they said, well, what should happen? You know, and I said, well, what should happen is, is we should probably have a common set of APIs across all vendors, both public and private, and there's a way to securely and transparently interconnect all these networks on the fly. And she looked at me, she goes, I agree. And I said, and I probably will die before that happens. It's just not gonna happen. Um, but it feels like it should, right? It's, it's, there's still machines. It's a machine. There's the same machines all over the place, yet the way you provision them, the way you secure them, the way you actually manage them, the way you monitor them, um, is totally different. The way you access services, the way you set up things like auto scale groups on Amazon versus all kinds of different things on Google Compute and software, they're all different. And that just solidifies these borders, solidifies friction, and it drives people back to, oh yeah, we have a hybrid cloud strategy. We do this over here, and we do something totally different over here. So imagine if those borders didn't have to exist. Um, and again, this is non-trivial and it's not easy, but if they did not exist, what would the world look like? What was interesting for me when I came into Google, I came in in 2003, um, was there was a couple mantras that were in place. Hardware never talked to software. So literally, the hardware people never had to say dilly squat to anybody about the machine they were about to unplug that they were walking down the, the aisle with the tray of hard disks. Hard disks were the ones that just failed all the time. And that was kind of interesting, because I had come from a company called Tipco for about 12 years, where you know, we really tried to make sure the hardware was reliable, and we knew what it was doing, and everybody was knowing where everything was running. The other interesting thing was is that at Google, software people didn't talk to machines. They talked to a system called the Borg, right? A, an intermediary in terms of saying, hey, could you please do this for me? I couldn't say, ooh, I want that seat right there. The Borg would look across and figure out all the seats and say, okay, you're going to sit here today. Now, what was interesting is at the time, the Borg was very rudimentary, but I think the light bulb moment for me was is that there wasn't a border between what I was trying to do and, let's say, Google Search or Google Ads. The interesting thing, though, is, is if you got stuck on a machine where Google Search was running, you were kind of SOL, and your, your process really kind of got starved out. And so we would then shoot that one, and then it would get moved around by the Borg until we actually got happy. Um, but again, that was 12 years ago. Now, what's interesting is that consumer tech seems to be running ahead of kind of enterprise IT tech. And borderless computing is really getting real in consumer tech. I mean, I remember a time when you know, you, you take a picture, and then you had to plug it in and sync, and then, then you had to copy it to get it to somewhere where you could archive it, and then um, all of these different texts that, you know, slowly were coming and, and delivering the promise of borderless computing, um, and it was not fun. It was a little bit painful, but for the most part now, I take a picture, 
It automatically goes to Dropbox, goes to Carousel, goes to iCloud. It's all over the place. Um, luckily, nobody cares about the photos I take, so if they're stolen, it's no big deal. But the interesting part is, is I could literally take my phone right now, take a picture of you, pause maybe a second, put it on the floor and crush it, go get another one, and all my stuff comes back. For the most part, I can do that with this. What's crazy is, is that, because uh, I live in San Francisco, I'm a real big fan of, of Tesla. I have a Tesla car, and everyone's like, oh, well, Tesla cars are they're different, or a car is different. I literally, about four months ago, upgraded my car. I drove in, 40 minutes later, I drove out. The car looked exactly the same, but it was the newer P85D or whatever like that. All the stuff was already switched over. It's all electronic and all just reappeared. The car was a fungible asset. I could just throw it away and get a new one, and everything came back. And I think what Google taught me early on was is that IT and the resources, the hardware resources that we should use should be exactly the same way. Yet a lot of the this absolutely has to work now type of technology in IT is it runs on that computer in the closet. Please don't touch it. Do not pass go. Stay away, right? And so we need to, to move past the, the border, so to speak. So at least for, for us at Epsera, um, we want to easily leverage any available compute resource. And by compute, I mean not just compute, but network storage services. Across all clouds, all infrastructure, from any vendor, in a connected, seamless, but highly secure and trusted fashion. I've been talking a lot about um, trust lately, and it's, it's interesting because I can't really define it. But I can tell you, you know when you have it, and you know when you don't. And I'm pretty sure a lot of people don't have trust, not only in the public cloud yet, but they don't have trust in any type of hybrid cloud. And at least the customers that we've been talking to really get kind of wigged out when we try to draw a connective line in between what's running on-premise in their data center and anything out in Amazon or Google or software or Azure. So why it matters, um, Remember the modern IT economy, and it's around data, and then the APIs, and then the services that generate more APIs, which hopefully turn the data into information that's actually useful. Um, the amount of unstructured data being generated is astounding. And for the most part, I'd say 85 plus percent of it is being unused today. I was at, um, actually right here about uh, three months ago or so, two months ago, at a conference called TED. So TED is actually in Vancouver for the last two years. Um, and there was a talk from an MIT PhD grad student. And he talked about the fact that even our perceived world, we only perceive like this much of what's really going on around us. And then he showed a picture of a, uh, what looked like a picture. And he goes, this is actually a video. And you're looking at it and it's just like a picture and it's not moving at all. And it was a picture of a bag of chips. And you can go on YouTube and actually see it now. It's pretty amazing. And behind a soundproof barrier, he had a camera, a high-speed video camera that was watching it. He flipped to a little bit of math and algorithms, and he immediately flipped to his algorithm can recreate the conversation that was happening in the room between two people with a bag of chips in between them. The only reason I point this out is that it was literally looks like a bag of chips. And it looks like nothing was going on there and yet he extracted all of this information out of it. Um, it is a great talk, I would recommend you go see it. The, the coolest part was what he did next, which was once he had kind of the infrastructure and all of the stuff working, he took a weekend project to do the exact same thing, but actually recreate the material composition of something just from a video. And so then he showed a picture of a tree, and it was barely moving, but all he needed was that little bit of movement and then he ran a fully automated simulation where he would pull the tree and it was materially correct. Now what's interesting for, again, us in San Francisco is, is what if you could just have cameras watching buildings and say, hey, this building might have a problem if we have an earthquake over 4.5. Point I'm trying to make is, is that it sounds like it's like, oh, well, that's kind of way, way out there, some MIT PhD grad student type stuff. But I'm telling you, the world we live in today, even as enterprises are trying to extract more information out of the data, we're barely tapping what's below the surface. And so the ability to bring massive amount of compute resources very quickly to a problem to extract things that people can't see um, is going to be you know, the difference, in my opinion, between who wins and who loses. 
So with IoT, you know, um, IoT is a big thing that I've been watching. It's very interesting. Right now, we're in the very, very first baby steps of sensors everywhere generating data. Um, the trend, though, is pretty clear to see. It just depends on how long we get there. And for me, again, that thing that if you ask me to define I can't uh, trust is what we need to get there. But I'll give you a quick example. So uh, I'm old. I'm trying to run and, and stay in shape. But let's say I have a pacemaker. Or you can talk about an airline engine, you know, an airplane engine. Eventually, the sensors are creating data that is being farmed, manipulated, watched through cloud services, and then they want to close the loop and send something back to change the behavior. We're talking about pacemakers and we're talking about airplane engines, but within enterprise IT, we want to take the data, we want to process it, we want to make intelligent decisions. Actually, we don't. We want the machines to. And we want to send control back to actually affect what's going on. And in certain situations, it's very easy to see, oh, we can kind of maybe do that today in contrived examples. But I'd ask you to kind of just think in your head, all right, well, what happens if we are talking about the pacemaker that keeps Derek standing up? What level of trust has to exist for me to trust that the sensors that's maybe on my Apple iWatch, if I ever get one, and my Fitbit or whatever, are trusted? that they're trusting the data that they're sending to the cloud service. They trust the communication. They trust the cloud service. The cloud service has to be trusted the communication back to the pacemaker to say, oh, shock him. He's about to fall over. And he's on stage. That wouldn't look good. You start understanding this notion of, again, that thing I can't define, trust, but how we actually need to, to look at that. And I'm not going to do that on my iPhone, right? There's going to be massive amounts of computing resources and things all over that I want to be able to take advantage of, whether I own them or not, to do this. And so for us, you know, breaking down these barriers is kind of you know, uh, the mission of the company. The company was started about three years ago, and we're trying to solve some really, really hard problems. But whether we do or not, the industry has to figure out how to get rid of these borders in order to really kind of take advantage of what we have. Um, not playing the old card too much, but my iPhone is more powerful than the supercomputers I used in college. And yet, for the most part, I use it to check email and look at Facebook and Twitter, you know, and things like that. But with machine learning, with all different types of things around anomaly detection, threshold management, there's a tremendous amount of information that can be mined from what we're already doing today. And we're not going to do it with our own data centers, right? We're going to do it with all of the resources that are available. And the person that can do that in a trusted fashion in the fastest way is going to have an advantage. And so for us, you know, with, with a hybrid cloud operating system, we want to be able to just deploy, orchestrate, govern. And again, govern is just as bad a word as policy. Um, but across any asset that we might have access to, whether we own it or not. We talked about the, the pacemaker example. But this notion of even the passport, right, which um, I have to use to get back into the United States tonight. You know, do I know you? Can I trust you? What resources can you get access to? Remember, there's probably, uh, I might have my math wrong, we're what, getting close to 8 billion people in the world, right, and these are all talking about carbon stuff. Think about how many different software systems need identity and trust in this new world. Right? The reason IoT is such a big deal for such massive you know, makers is if anyone kind of missed the boat on mobile, they can make it up a hundredfold in IoT. Right? It's going to be that big. So for us, policy and governance is the key. And again, these a lot of times are bad words because people see them and go, oh crap, that means we've got to slow down, this is going to suck, you know, we can't do what we need to do. I fundamentally believe policy, governance, and security done right gets out of your way. It's kind of like guardrails. It just makes you safe, but it doesn't slow you down. And we know what happens when, well, I think most of us have seen what happens when companies try to go very fast and things get kind of loose. Um, and all of a sudden, you feel like you're safe, but you're not. Uh, I had a, uh, a CEO who I'm not going to mention, but I, I remember sitting in front of him one time. And he says, Derek, he goes, let me make it as clear as possible. Go as fast as you possibly can, but keep my name out of the newspapers. And I remember laughing and chuckling at that, but then I also kind of said, wow, what does that really mean? You know, one, he wanted hands off. He's like, don't tell me what you're about to do. Just keep going, but keep my name out of the newspapers. And he was serious, but he also was kidding. But then 
first time, at least in the United States history, I believe, you know, a CEO lost his job because of an IT breach. Not the CIO, not the CISO, but Target's CEO, right? That's a pretty big deal. And so companies need to innovate. They need to go faster. But how do they do that in a safe way? And most people think these are opposing forces, and we don't. So, you know, policy for utilizing infrastructure and securing access control and new technologies and environments. We did a demo yesterday in the marketplace room where, um, you know, we, we showed the notion of a developer deploying an application, and that's not new and exciting, right? You want that friction to go to zero. But the interesting part was is that policy was all around this workload as it moved from OpenStack to Amazon to Google, totally seamlessly, yet governed by policy. Network access was totally exactly the same everywhere. There was no concept of, well, let's try to recreate that on Amazon and make sure we kind of got it right and hope that we did, all right? And it worked. I didn't have to high five anybody. It worked every single time, all right? And we had every single region in Amazon represented, every single region in Google. And I think the last little app we showed was a map app that just showed which application was responding and where it was on the globe. And we kept hitting refresh and it's ping ponging between Japan and Ireland and Europe and North America. The app was fairly simple, but it was connected to a database running in Amazon. We were redoing the network on the fly as everything was moving around, and it was a trusted environment. And I think a lot of people that came up after the demo were like, well, how did you do that? And I said, I can promise you I didn't do it in a weekend, and I didn't do it in the last six months, and I definitely didn't do it by myself. So a lot of hard problems here, but they are tractable problems. So the future, right? Internet of things, big data, this modern IT economy, how do we actually go fast enough and use all the resources that we need? When we started the talk, I told you this is not gonna be a, a pragmatic talk uh, per se, but more of a kind of where things are going. But borderless computing driven by trust, I think is the future that we're looking at. If we back it up today, what does that mean? What's the first step? And for me, that's true hybrid computing, right? And hybrid computing in terms of, we're here at an OpenStack conference, so how do we root some of that with our investment in OpenStack? Probably running on-premise, well, although I would imagine there's some cloud service providers here that are using it. And then seamlessly extend that out to any compute infrastructure, any public cloud. And again, at least in my opinion, more importantly, a public cloud that either offers another competitive advantage, usually through a service, maybe through pricing, although I actually don't think you're going to be, everyone says, oh, you're going to move around to get, you know, pennies on the dollar. Well, if you've got 500,000 workloads, maybe. But it's interesting to see this technology at work in terms of leverage going, well, we could move by just clicking a button. In less than three seconds, we'd have all our workloads off of Amazon to Google. Um, but more importantly, it's like, how do we take advantage of these services, right, that are coming online? I'll give you a good example of, of our 50,000-year-old hardware that can't think really well ahead. Um, at least I can. Um, you know, 5G is about to hit in 2020. And I remember when we went from 3G to 4G, and then 4G to LTE, right? And we're stepping up. And it's just not speed of access. Remember I said, you keep doing th the same things you're doing faster and faster and faster, and then eventually get fast enough that you actually do things differently? 5G is going to radically change the way we do a lot of different things, whether it's conscious or not. And so now, What's interesting is, is that the telco providers, who to date really haven't been able to take full advantage of cloud computing opportunities, right, they might be able to come up with services that if something like you know, OpenStack plus Absera exists, and it does today, allows us to friction-free actually direct certain workloads to that to take advantage of that service, all based on policy, all governed by you know, a technology that you can trust, it becomes very interesting that now hybrid means multiple public clouds, private infrastructure on OpenStack. Today, um, you know, we've got the technology that you can see, you can feel, you can touch. We'll install it. It'll work, I promise. Um, it's been about three years in the making on terms of how we did this. Today we have SoftLayer, Amazon, and Google. We're going to add Azure. Um, and of course, on the private cloud side, OpenStack, which is why we're all here, um, but then also VMware in terms of the 800-pound the gorilla. What's interesting, though, is there's this massive ecosystem toolkit. I believe the trust comes eventually in an integrated solution, 
But today, I think most enterprises look at a toolkit, a toolbox of things that they want to pull from, um, including OpenStack. Um, and for us, we are very conscious about putting things back into that toolbox and also partnering in and integrating with things in there. Schedulers, network, container security are probably a lot of the things you've heard as you've been walking around the conference for the last several days. Thank you. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions uh, that you might have. Hopefully you found it useful. Again, it's not how to deploy a heat map on OpenStack today, but I promise you this will become relevant faster than we think. Again, because we're using very, very old hardware. Any questions? You got to have at least one. So the question is, when we're moving workloads, are we touching a database um, or something in terms of workloads? Um, our system is comprised of kind of three main uh, logical points. Um, a routing plane, layer three through seven. A management plane, which is the persistent state of packages and jobs and where things are running and how they link and channel together. That obviously is being updated, right? It's not a single point of failure. It's a replicated system. When the workloads are actually moving, though, all of the policy is wrapped around the workload, and it's being enforced all at the endpoints. So if I move you from Amazon to Google, but you are connected to a database in Amazon, we redo the network on the fly based on authenticated policy that's digitally signed when the workload appears in Google in our, in our runtime. Does that make sense? Sure. So the question is, what happened to the data that my app was using when my app got moved? Um, in the demo we gave yesterday, the to-do app, the database was actually provisioned and introduced into our system from Amazon. So we just used RDS. And so it didn't go anywhere. So what we did was when the, when the workload appeared in Google, policy was wrapped around and says it should be allowed to have access to this database. And our system, when you know, we see that, our system transparently figures out how to build routes on the fly, secure routes from Google all the way back to the database in Amazon. Now, if you wanted to move the database, right, that's going to be a huge issue, not an uh, AppSera issue. It's just a general issue around, well, how do you move like an S3 bucket to Google Cloud or IBM software, right? And, of course, there's, there's technologies to try to make that a leaky abstraction, but leaky abstractions are usually bad, at least in my opinion. Yes? It's actually very similar to the question that uh, the other gentleman was asking. Um, you mentioned earlier about all these like analytic data, big data, you know, exercise, and you know, however much it is. Um, so a lot of the companies we talk to actually want to uh, not really like burst, like they want to do like hybrid cloud, like, private and public, but they want to burst compute into the public cloud because of um, you know either like video encoding or some kind of other analytics. Mm -hmm. So in those cases, right, you really have to move the data around because otherwise you can't really have you can't really burst compute to the public cloud if you're trying to access data in your private cloud. So how, do, how does you guys handle that? Yeah, so um, that's a great question, which I don't have a great answer for. Um, there's still nothing as fast as a truckload of disks running down a highway, right? Speed of light and, and latency is, is important. But what's interesting about the demo we gave yesterday, um, which might not have been obvious, is, is that our network topology and how we actually reroute and secure everything is full mesh. So in other words, when the app moved over to Google and was accessing the database, there was a direct peer secure network connection between those. And the latency between those is pretty darn good. Um, that being said, there's also things that, and then this will really get woo-woo on you, but if uh, I study the kind of the way the brain works, the brain works in layers. And so there's a massive amount of data coming into your visual cortex, which gets processed in parallel and then moved on to different layers. And usually the signal is higher, um, the entropy is lower, um, but the amount of data is less. And so I think you're going to start seeing that. So again, my math might be off, but a GE engine on an airline generates, I don't know, 40 terabytes. You know, we can't download that all the way to the ground and check it and then bring something up. But there could be something where it's a trusted compute that goes up to the airplane, processes it, and sends specific amounts of data down. Um, in your case, when you do bursting, I don't think cloud bursting is actually a really good example of hybrid um, in reality. But I do see dev tests get spun up, and the data is actually being generated there. So in other words, it's not actually operating on something else, and then it kind of goes down. Again, I said I wouldn't have a great answer for it. You know, data gravity, which is, uh, I worked with a gentleman who kind of coined the term, I believe, 
Um, it's real, right? Speed of light is, is a constant. We can't change it. At least I don't think we can. Any others? Thank you very much. I appreciate it.